with um, yeah, Michael Meredith, who has, together with Hilary Sample, the office Moss. Uh, quite frankly, I mean, we've had last year uh, Mark Lee, and I would argue, apart from uh, Mark Lee, the only relevant office of our generation in the States. And I mean, that of course is silly to say, because what else is there in the States? Uh, I'd say, um, no, but I mean, they're first of all, I think, good friends, but one of these few people that we feel uh, we have a lot in common, at least we can discuss architecture, yeah. they're interested in architecture, uh, and um, as you know, the difficult level always is, from our side, an attempt to link them with, with somebody, with something. We did not link them with one architect, but with five. <laughs> um, perhaps because uh, they need that wide, uh, uh, let's see, uh, a group of uh, reference, I don't know. Um, Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm very happy you could come, um, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be great. Thank you. I will just move the see if this works. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I literally have uh, so the way I, the the kind of brilliance of these things is um, is to be forced out of your own little space, let's say that you're working in. To think about the New York Five again, for me, is a kind of weird provocation. So I'm just going to give my list. I've made some notes. Basically, it, the strategy was I was just going to try to do it informally, made some notes while coming here, basically. Uh, I assume everybody knows the book. We'll scroll through it together. But um, this is it. So. The notes on the near five. This is my list of observations, let's say. I'll go through it and then I'm going to spend a little bit more time on one architect, just Haydock's drawings. Um, okay, so Square, the book itself, Helvetica, published 1972. I think it has an aesthetics of lists. If you look at it, everything is a kind of list. Even the, the format of it is a. Um, is, is almost like, let's say, um, the bureaucratic model of like Joseph Muller Brockman, or something like this, of kind of design. Um, supported by MoMA. The preface is by um, Arthur Drexler, who was the curator there, uh, did the Beaux Arts show after this, Transformation of the Modern, which I think is really an interesting show. Um, comes out of a conference. Uh, the approach, his text is a short little text in the preface, um, which is similar to Colin Rowe's continuation of modernism. Basically, the idea is to link them back to modernism. It's kind of strange that he does this, and then the show, let's say, right after is a Beaux Arts show. Sort of, I think for me, explains a kind of, let's say, the volatility of the times. Um, uh, I like sort of the sort of the alternative to political romance is what he talks about that th these guys represent. Colin Rowe, I can go back to this note thing. I'll just change. I'll just deal with it at some other point. Um, the introductions by Colin Rowe. It's kind of incredibly, let's say exhausting text if you try to get through it. I think part of its effect is to be exhausting. Um, it, it's strange for me that Aldo Van Eyck is such a presence. I didn't realize it actually at the time, rereading again. I mean, in Aldo Van Eyck is also a presence in Venturi's introduction. Sure. From So the the secret influence of Van Eyck is a kind of weird, a weird thing for me. Um, so the problem of, uh, it sort of starts off with the problem of meaning, which I think is always interesting because these are also, let's say, the, a group of, like if you think about someone like Eisman, uh, or even this, the aesthetic of lists as a problem, it's generally a problem that tries to avoid meaning. I think that inevitably this kind of anti-meaning is always bound to meaning. Uh, so um, sort of, uh, sort of, 
ends with the, the paradoxes of, of Van Eyck, let's say, and sort of the, the narrative is a collapse of American European narratives, which is maybe modernism. It sort of presents architecture after rationalism or technological determinism, after a utopian project, after the institutionalization of modernism, uh, after form and function splits. I think part of it to date, like even at the end of the text, there's something about the kind of problems of the computer and data collection, which was bizarre that this was even something in the 70s to think about. Um, uh, and I think the point of the whole text for me was to go back and to complicate modernism to allow for this space to produce a kind of a modernism that is paradoxical, which it probably was, but just, you know, let's say another narrative that would not be the narrative of, of uh, let's say, Gropius at the time, uh, to allow for this paradoxical space for them to, to work in. The next section of it is... Um, So this is it. You can see it's, it's pretty like, even for Colin Rowe, it's a, it's a weird, it's a pretty exhausting text. So uh, the, the sort of, so the beginning and the end, I'll just do the Van Eyck quotes maybe, just so you get a sense of it. Sorry, scrolling. Uh, what you should try to accomplish is built meaning. So get close to the meaning and build, which I think is both funny and, I don't know how to take it. I thought it was kind of, uh, it was funny in the fact that it's irresolvable. And then um, and in the end, it sort of is the same, same similar thing, let's say. So is it necessary that architecture should be simply a logical derivative from function, functional and technological facts, and indeed, can it ever be this? Is it necessary that a series of buildings should imply a vision of a new and better world, and if so, if, if this is so, or even if it's not, then how frequently can a, vi a significant vision of new and better worlds be propounded? <coughs> is the architect simply a victim of circumstance? This is also super male-centric, so I, like it's always he's, but it, uh, and, and should he be, or may he be allowed to cultivate his own free will, and are not culture and civilization <coughs> products of the imposition of will? What is the zeitgeist? And if this is a critical fic uh, fiction, may the architect act contrary wise to its alleged dictates. How permissible is it to use the precedent and therefore how legitimate is the argument that the repetition of a form is a destruction of authenticity? Can an architecture which professes an objective of continuous experiment ever become congruous with the ideal of an architecture which is to be popular, uh, intelligible, and profound? I think those are good, those are still questions relevant, by the way, <laughs> today. I don't know how, uh, they're impossible. So the next section is, is Frampton, and Ken Frampton's piece, to me, is amazing that it even is there, because he's pretty harsh. Like, nobody would do this nowadays. Like, we are all too afraid of this idea of criticism. Like, um, he's, he's pretty ruthless on Peter Eisman. Uh, and they've had a they had a they've had a kind of long tortured history maybe together, but um, so I think it's I, I always think Frampton is actually incredibly precise as a critic. Um, so it's sort of brutal, clear, formalist, matter of fact, and distant. He uses the formal reading to critique it. Uh, some of the things he talks about is the scalelessness of it, sort of the indifference to physical experience. Uh, the rotation of Hayduck and, and Eisman taken from right, uh, the obscuring of en the entrance, etc. Um, and same with, uh, there's like a lot of games of rotation in the, in the plans you'll see in the form. Um, I never really associated with right before, but I thought that was interesting. Um, Eisman, he talks about building as a ruin, um, which I also thought was interesting because this is pre, let's say, decon, but uh, a project of ambivalence and unresolved tensions, the presence of absence, impossible to perceive what is happening or why. This is pretty hard. Um, Hayduck and Guathme, the, this play between frontalization and rotation. Uh, Graves, this is how he groups them in a way. Meyer, Eisman, erosion and mannered. 
quote unquote. He doesn't talk about Meyer much in general. Meyer is definitely overlooked in the whole thing. I thought that was interesting. Uh, everyone but Guathmi is quote unquote indifferent to building culture, general building culture. They don't care about how things get made. Uh, he praises Guathmi, criticizes Eisman. Everyone but Hayduck has an aura of post Corbusian space, although it's not experienced like Corb in a kind of promenade, it's experienced in its representation through drawing. The book itself, so this is the these are my cri the cribsh notes, so you'll have to take it for what it's worth. On a, like literally, uh, so Peter, uh, these are the, the one thing that you can say is the representation of the of it is in, the one thing that's incredible is that everything is represented the same. This would never happen nowadays. So if you look at it. Every, every architect is, is decided that they're going to represent their projects the same way. This just does not happen anymore. Um, sorry. And the, um, the one thing you can say the minor differences are, Guafmi seems to pochet his plans. Hayduck sometimes pochets them and sometimes doesn't. The projects are all houses, which is also rare, let's say, think about, let's say, nowadays. Um, if you look at the breakdown of how the architects present their own work, Eisman has a kind of long-winded uh, text at the beginning. Uh, so does Graves, kind of trying to place it within an art historical context. Uh, Guafmi has no text, just sort of the facts, likes to break it down into site, program, and construction method. Hayduck, really no text is similar in a way, but breaks it down into it lists a list of program, a list of surfaces, a list of ideas. Um, Meyer somehow is the middle, kind of the most uh, middle of the road, sort of a little bit of academic and a sort of pragmatic. Let me see if I can open this up. So, I mean, each of these you could talk about forever. I don't really know if I if I want to. Um, like the cardboard architecture thing, I think it's super was super important. But uh, I'm just going to show the work. So this is House One. Um, he the thing with Peter is he gives you the architecture and he gives you the the analysis of it at the same time, sort of, they become, you can't, you can't think about the building without the analytical. They become almost, uh, I think he uses, let's say, rationality as a symbol. So you go, you go through this, the drawings are pretty, in a way, straightforward. Um, the worm's eye axo. I mean, the idea of the diagonal, in, even in representation with the, is the diagonal is kind of everywhere, the rotation, let's say. Um, this is it, so he'll break it down into sort of the kind of ABA structures. Talk about how there's a simultaneity of different, of different readings of ABAs. It gets, the complexity of it, um, in the superimposition of these of these systems of of organization and composition, start to undermine each other. Produces some other effect. Everything is like the. I mean, I think these photos are amazing. By the way, these are the best parts of the Eisman houses. These strange. Uh, Winter, incredibly bleak, can't obscure, half the building is obscured photos. I mean, they're so bizarre and appealing to me. Again, this, like the, like look at this text to describe this house. I mean, how many pages? So three pages of text for your house and 
Okay. We have like maybe three pages or four, like how many of drawings? Four pages of drawings? Then the analytical <laughs> part. I mean, the obsessions at this time, I would say, were really about composition and problems of composition. So in, through painting into architecture. Similar to the other ones, again, like the ground is sort of eats up the, a little bit of the building. Incredibly bleak, like landscape, trying to reduce everything to, a, let's say, white. So, Graves. Um, Graves is the most fussy, let's say, of all of them. Like, you... you you can't separate the. They're kind, they're kind of amazing compositional, like complex compositions, let's say. But um, a lot of things are coming out of literally out of a painting, sort of Juan Gris paintings he talks about. But just even the idea of like the slight figures, etc., which kind of kind of enter into the plan. But this also ties into like. You know, everything, there is a kind of, in all the projects, a problem of, let's say, uh, the square and which, which has a, almost no orientation and then, rota and then rotation of the square. I think this is kind of, you know, this mural that he did is kind of the the point. I mean, look, even in the drawings, it's crazy that so much emphasis is put on that. The other thing that's, that's I noticed is, um, this is true in Peter's as well, is, is uh, the importance of the floor patterning. This is just not a problem anymore. But the pattern of the floor produces, flattens the entire plan in a way that produces kind of painterly effects. And it produces the, pro the thing, let's say rotation in a lot of cases also. sort of amazing to me now think about it. like these incredibly lyrical moments um, so Guathme I mean in a way when I when we're starting this I did want to I did want to like Guathme because I thought Guathme was the one that would be counterintuitive to like um, and from I was thinking this is maybe the one I should try to figure out how to like but I have to say I just can't stand the vertical wood siding and stuff like this. Like I just, I just can't get beyond it. Um, it's maybe a child, like my own experience of like a, let's say suburbia and a kind of idea of contemporary style uh, houses. Just. The plans themselves are, are kind of uh, amazingly straightforward and also complicated. You know, just things being slightly off, like throwing in things into rotation by just putting things slightly off center or changing like the reading of, let's say, um, idea of one square with inside of another square, you know, like that you can start to produce. Um, sort of multiple compositional readings, let's say. Yeah, even things of like a square there. So. I think at one point the games, I don't, I don't think anybody cares about this stuff anymore, but the games of architecture were this, you know, like, like you would look for, like you can see it for sure, and I'll go back to like uh, graves. It's the most perhaps overwrought, but like the, like you would, you can find squares everywhere, 
more or less. You know, that would be part of the problem when you're designing a building, like the composition of these things. So, um, and, so, and this would be the point of Peter's, like that, those sort of games produced Peter's plans. And then, the, then you would find like the missing corner, you would complete it yourself, and that would become the presence of absence that he would talk about. Like here, you know, you read a square here, you read a square here, rotated, you have a square here. Um, you have a squares inside of squares everywhere. Everything is like a, you, you know, why do you have a space like this, this tiny little space? I assume it's because you wanted a square. You know what I mean? Like there's no, it's hard to figure out an argument for it from without that. So, um, <coughs> Anyways, let's go to Haydek. Uh, for me, the Haydek, um, I just appreciated the the straightforwardness of it in some way. At one level, it's I think very sophisticated. Another level, completely dumb. So, um, and it's sophisticated in a a pro like maybe in the sense of the the compositional problems of let's say of plan making in most cases. Um, so, every also at this time, everyone, uh, let's say, or at least Tadak and, and Peter, uh, all the houses are numbered, also in two lists. So it's, this is house 10 by Heda. Um, and this kind of, the numbering, the numbering which is still a kind of, for me is part of a, we could talk about that more. It's sort of an extension of a kind of, let's say, uh, indifference, a model of indifference in architecture, or in modernism even, that comes out that's extended to today. It's sort of like trying to find ways to say, uh, to produce nothing, to tr have almost like no, to say as little as possible, sort of positivist approach. Um, so house 10, program. I mean, look, just look at this. Imagine you tried to present like this in a school, you would, it would be kind of, at least where I teach, you'd probably get yelled at. Um, garage, walk, entry, living, dining, kitchen, gallery, storage, bathroom, bedroom. Like no hierarchy that I can really discern. Um, just presented in a kind of very matter-of-fact, deadpan manner. Uh, surfaces, he, I think it's interesting, he says surfaces instead of, let's say, material. So, because for him, let's say, the color color is also a material in a way, it's, or they're both just about surfaces. So, glass, as shown, uh, interior walls white, exterior walls stainless steel or chrome. Idea con slash concept or hyphen concept. Horizontal extension, hypotenuse. Seems misspelled actually, doesn't it? Um, three quarter figure, point line plane volume, biomorphic, biotechnic, structure, time projection. <laughs> totally bizarre and interesting. And then you get this, which is obviously. Uh, Amazing project. Uh, and what do you need to say about it? I mean, in a way, it definitely just takes apart the ideas of, let's say, plan and figure, gets rid of, uh, let's say, almost uh, the edge condition or the, the frame of, 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 a, of a building or of, of a composition. Like even things like this, you enter on center. Like imagine this as your kind of entry into like a kind of nothing, and then you turn and go in. I mean, so it's, it's pretty bizarre and interesting entry. I think. And then you're you're kind of caught in a kind of very uh, attenuated space. Chimneys on either end, there's sort of a, there's a sort of symmetry to it. 
Like also, Hadek I think is the best at dealing with the graphic design. If you look at all the other architects, how they occupy a page, let's say, of the square in the book, they're all cramming it with so much stuff. Hadek, so like look at this, this is pretty, there's like nothing here. Projection D. It's just sort of, the, for him the frame is the page almost. Whereas I think all the other, the other um, architects are thinking like that. He's already thinking about his drawings, not on the, in the medium in which they're presented, which I think is pretty amazing. Like why, you know, I don't know if this really shows you anything more than the last one, but it definitely is a different, um, say, image. He's the only one with color. Somehow he's, I don't know how he negotiated that, but like when this page pops up, it's, it's incredible. It's just all of a sudden relief from the entire book. Um, I love this project. I think this is probably one of my favorites. It's probably one of the smallest project in the, in the book too. So program, house. Surfaces, exterior, yellow, blue, red, black, white, gray. <laughs> I mean, basically, that's also yellow, blue, red, of course, is preloaded. Um, color, exterior, primaries, interior, white. So that's the concept. Can, you, can anybody imagine this nowadays? Imagine if you were... And, and you can see, for me, when you see this, I think um, I think of a few things, but let's say even a plan, I, I, would, I would imagine even the influence of someone like Charles Moore a little bit, some of the early Moore. Um, I think um, definitely <coughs> Corb is in all of them. I think even despite um, Frampton saying that Hayduck is somehow outside of Corb, it's always there. Um, he is definitely playing with things that are just basic architectural stuff, like from my point of view, like uh, let's say going from a very uh, tight space to like all of a sudden a break with glass to a thick wall to a open space again, uh, sort of very simple games of, of um, promenade, problems of centering and recentering, so like like the square again is uh, for sure being played with, like orientation, constant games of centering and recentering, <coughs> these are the, the games of composition are really games of, for me, um, localized symmetries for the most, most cases, I think that's the kind of that's sort of architecture, and maybe uh, just the, the amount you do is becomes the mannerism or not. Um, so you know, you have a space here, and even this slight curve distorts things, starts to produce diagonals, starts to shift. Like, is this like just how do you start to divide the space up? Um, same with this. Balcony. I mean, again, these bal like, what's the point of a little balcony? <laughs> Doesn't really sit. Like, what does this show in some way? Um, I think if you look at the, um, so this this project, the next project is also, let's say, it's called the one, it's the one half house. So basically the idea is just take half of every shape and try to make a house out of it. I mean, it seems like a pretty bizarre approach to, to, to start in a way. In a way it's incredibly dumb, but incredibly, um, powerful at some level. 
program, entry walk, living, dining, kitchen, music library, bathrooms, bedrooms. Again, no, no hierarchy. Um, surfaces, glass as shown, interior walls white, exterior walls white. Uh, one half of a circle concept, one half of a circle, one half of a uh, square, one half of a diamond. I think the fascination with pianos also, like the, the piano as a kind of protagonist for figuration just does not exist anymore, but you couldn't, you couldn't understand Richard Meyer, I think, without the piano. Um, the literal shape of a piano. And same, same with uh, probably Guasini too. Like, look at this. Like, this is the beginning of, of later Hiduk's works. Like, he, you know, the guy who invented tangential touch. Basically, objects that touch just on the corner. That was kind of one of his inventions. So bizarre. I'm not sure what the role, I think also to figure out the role of these two uh, bars, maybe just to produce this frame. I mean, it, it is, everything I think in these, the narratives of architecture at this time are put into an idea of composition, but composition is, um, is not just formalism. Let's say it's politics, um, it's uh, meaning, um, it's the social project, even, etc. So this is Meyer. Um, I don't know. I thought it was all a little bit. Uh, it's like too much and not enough. <coughs> this text to be critical a little bit, but the you know sort of su super sophisticated at one level, but also completely completely banal to me. The best part of this drawing is the fireplace. Somehow it doesn't, it doesn't really quite exist in the same world as the, the rest of us. I think just to end in, uh, on New York 5, upside down, um, I'm just going to go through, I thought their bios were interesting, just how architects um, describe themselves. So Eisman is academic first and then presented mostly as an urbanist. I thought it was also interesting that he was 40 <laughs> at the time. Um, you can, where is it, the bios? Um, um, I, you may, like you would never think of Peter nowadays as somebody who would forefront urban urban design, but he, that's where he came, comes out of, for sure. I mean, some of the earliest work he did with, with Graves were, he did a project for the redevelopment of Harlem uh, in New York, um, you know, the Roosevelt Island stuff. He, there, were, there were a series of projects he worked through, and they were all associated at the time with universities. It was, it was that. So um, Graves is an academic first, and then he described, he groups his buildings that he's doing, he's saying stuff like um, medical facilities, museums, public housing, just sort of lists the, the, them. Um, Guadalupe is the youngest, he's, and he sort of puts that out there, is 34 years old, where nobody else says how old they are. Uh, it's sort of a point of pride. Um, he has the longest bio, also, and he lists every project individually. So he'll say things like residential, student residential complex and dining facility at the State University at Purchase, New York. You know, uh, stuff like this. 
pay duck is the oldest with the shortest bio. <laughs> Says nothing about practice. I tend to like people with shorter bios in general. I think shorter the bio, the better. Um, personal preference, I guess. Um, Richard Meyer, uh, similar in the sense that he focuses on his built work, not his education, not academic, and he lists the individual projects like Wathme does. So he says things like, uh, the Health and Mental Hygiene Facilities Improvement Corporation, 500 units of housing at the Twin Parks Northeast in the Bronx for the Urban Development Corporation, recently completed, etc. So it's just sort of, I think, individual buildings. I think it's interesting. So, um, so there is that. I don't know. So the difficult double, I guess, is the format. I can talk about that. I can also, um, we can use that as a starting point. I'm also in, uh, happy to talk about other things. Like I, my recent uh, obsessions, I was saying, are not, are not on maybe the New York Five, although I think it's interesting to think about it again, but are on things like, uh, um, what I've been thinking about is just contemporary, the model of uh, aesthetics of indifference. This is what I've been thinking about. Um, for as a contemporary model for practice, which I think fits in a kind of generational mode uh, at the time. And it's sort of the, for me, the, the model, the aesthetics of indifference model is very much, it's from, um, it's taken from a, an art forum essay from the late 70s from an art critic, Maura Raw, and she, she uses it as a, as a point of criticism, actually, as a problem for art, which I think it could be seen as a kind of liberation in a way, um, but let's say she says after, let's say, extreme partisan, after abstract expressionism, uh, after extreme, extreme politics, uh, McCarthy and the Red Scare and communism emerged a kind of model of indifference in the arts through Duchamp, Cage, um, Rauschenberg, and Jasper Johns and which leads towards, which eventually turns into, let's say, pop, which is extension of the model of indifference, and then to minimalism. So this, this idea of indifference sort of bridges, let's say, minimalism and pop as a problem, as an aesthetic uh, condition, tone almost, a deadpan, you get like Rouché out of it, you get, um, uh, you get conceptual art practices, Eventually, like Buclo picks up on indifference to to characterize the bureaucratic administration art movement um, and things like this. So, for me, the model of, of indifference are kind of are coming after a moment where uh, of the parametric. In, in my case, I, I think of pedagogy and and um, um, let's say the idea of a, the discipline of architecture is incredibly, it's incredibly provincial. So we're coming in a moment after the parametric, after a kind of incredible uh, expansion of skills in the field, after an idea of, of progress, uh, of, of progressive architecture through technology. And I think we're at a moment where, uh, let's say, and the techno so the narrative I usually give is like we the neo avant garde relied on techniques so techniques of composition let's say techniques that would undermine authorship so you you know people playing with games of let's say geometry art you do it so that you frustrate your own willful expression you know it's kind of uh, an old uh, kind of games somehow these narratives of technique turn into technology let's say the 90s reliance on the comp of computation as a model just simply turn into technology uh, games and technology does what technology does in the sense that it produces um, a parade of novelty to give a sense of progress so you get like a, every new week we get a new fabrication technique or a new um, gizmo 
that is promises to make things better, like the promise when we were uh, students was that you could do incredible difference and it would cost the same as repetition or something like this. You know what I mean? Like this was a kind of, at least when I was taught that was kind of a thing. So you could use the computer now, the computer is going to get rid of problems of labor even or problems, whatever it would be. Robots will produce amazing buildings. Um, and I think nowadays we don't, after we've gone through this, there's a real reluctance to believe in progress or originality. Part of it is tied to media also, so there's a perfect storm of the technological project kind of aligned with uh, a kind of new forms of media in the field. And so it's almost impossible to think of, for me at this moment, to think of an original architecture or somebody or something that's new. It feels like everything is referential. And I think that's a good thing some basic level like so the idea of that we would that we, the technology project also relied on let's say I think more than any other project, the idea of being new or being original or trying to produce some new widget or new new kind of architecture I think for me now I just can't after seeing so much of it I just can't imagine it and also there's been an incredible flattening of production after that. So but part of what's going on now is like a kind of almost anti-technological narratives. So a kind of response to the parametric, there's a, like the, the fact that there's an interest in painting again in the field is bizarre. The fact that people are hand drawing everything again is bizarre to me. The fact that like all these, th these models that I would think are explicitly I mean, just wouldn't have happened 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago or something. I don't know. Just would not have happened. So there's an explosion of kind of, of kind of a flattening of production even, that everything is, is collected now into a kind of flatbed picture plane of production. So, so you have, you know, you do computer modeling and hand drawing and diagrams and models, and it's all and scripting, it all just exists together. There's no hierarchy almost in it. I don't know where I'm going with any of this shit, by the way. So, uh, I can, so the indifference, this was my, this was note, notes from a different lecture I gave recently. Um, <laughs> the Belgians have replaced the Japanese. But like the, there's a, definitely, is a, we've witnessed a return to to a kind of uh, almost pre-internet model, um, and I think I think that's it, it's uh, it's true. Also, I would say like the things like in this model of, of um, that we're in currently, let's say the Wolf Linian tradition of of difference and to understand architecture. So you have this versus that. Uh, it is a model which relied on a very strong historical narrative, has kind of gone away, and now the problem is more like Amazon algorithms. So it's like, if you like this, you'll also like that. And it's basically a problem of how to collect stuff and, not, and find sameness as opposed to trying to exploit difference. So it's a kind of, we're in an interesting moment. Um, um, uh, to think about how do we how do we even think about architecture at this moment? Anyways, so architectural indifference, I would say, if I had to, if I was trying to characterize it, um, I also was interested in indifference out of coming after a moment of let's say the last decade has been curatorial projects on urgency, like everywhere you look. Um, like I think right now MoMA's next show at MoMA is on refugee camps, et cetera. And I sit through things, that I sit through where I teach, I teach with like, with Liz. Liz Diller is always saying to students like, what's urgent, you know, and the students never can respond to it. Like, you know, what's urgent to you right now? And I always think like, well, maybe we should stop asking everybody what's urgent because it's not getting us anywhere. And, um, I don't think students are like struggling against corporate modernism or something where she feels like she's doing, or like trying to attack a kind of certain models 
of architecture. I think now, um, I think indifference in this sort of idea of, a, let's say, a deadpan a kind of approach, it would, it's an architecture that puts things together that don't necessarily belong, it stares blankly, it collects, it cools down, it confuses or equivocates, like, let's say, parts and holes. It plays with the relationship of difference and sameness. I think uh, probably sameness over difference. Um, indifference works in, I like the indifference also that's just somehow can be read as like not different, let's say. Indifference works within the vaguely familiar, the dead plan. It uses our collective state of constant distraction and flattened forms of attention, flattened forms of production towards constructing our pressure. That's all I got at the moment. I don't know what you guys, what do you guys want to talk about? No, if, if I may, yeah. I mean, slightly provokingly ask you, would you be able to show a project of yours as an illustration of where you are? Sure. Um, I think in our work, if I, I would probably characterize it more in, as a kind of general sense of our work. I can go through, I can just scan, um, scan our work for everybody. I'll just go through an old lecture I gave and just flip through it really quickly so mm -hmm. you can see the work. But um, these are also all texts I collected that are just kind of about in different skill for the Ranciere, which I just love in general as a text about politics and aesthetics. So these, this was a lecture I gave recently um, somewhere at UCLA, I guess. So part of it is, um, okay, so then we start, I started with, uh, let's say, our, our rules. This is a kind of rule set, actually, that we have in our office a little bit. I mean, changes. I don't know why we do it. I don't know. Just a way to sort of think about. I think one of the biggest problems of having an office, let's say, and we, we're a very small office, is how do you construct a kind of culture of the office? Like, because everybody is very different, let's say, and and uh, so you know, in something that's beyond us individually, even some idea of the office has its own autonomy, its own culture. Um, so. Part of it is writing these rules allows us to do that, and also um, part of it is like different things that we do in the office that have no client. So like we'll make movies a lot of times of our projects and write little stories about them. We will do software experiments that that are basically an extension of playing with video game physics to deal with composition. So generally, we, we are, are indebted to a to a problem of non-composition in architecture, I think. And usually it turns into two categories for us, maybe both extreme. One is just like blankness and nothing. And like, just like, let's say, uh, the, dumb, the dumb square or something like this. Or it's, or it's like the scatter, sort of like the casual just dropped, like nobody, like no order almost. So, so those two extremes exist in our work simultaneously, I would say. Um, yeah, no, that's rule number two. So the banal is in our work, I think. It has been in our work, the boring. I mean, I think since the beginning, pursuing the deadpan, the vaguely familiar, the generic architecture, the inclusive, except a non-synthetic project. We've definitely always approached architecture through kind of archetypal elements, for whatever reason, a kind of disassembled architecture that is being reassembled. So like um, chimneys, windows, corridors. But there you're so close to Haiti, right? Yeah. Yes, maybe. That's part of the... I was fishing for yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Go ahead. True. <laughs> um, repetition is in our work. We definitely produce, are interested in, let's say, sameness over expressive difference. So a lot of our work is um, involves literal repetition. Yeah, I don't know. Some of these things, I, I'm not even sure what they mean. Like, I, I have no idea what rule number eight means, but it sounded right at the time. Sort of. Uh, so any things, like from very early projects, let's say, things like uh, houses. This was actually a master plan of, of five houses that only ended up being two that got built and the client moved. But um, it was all the same, basically the same building, just put in different parts of the city. <coughs> An artist studio. I 
don't really need to say much. I mean, each one of these I could talk about like little architectural games, like uh, just an open space that's that is a uh, uh, like kind of a large vaulted, let's say, interiorized hip roof. We sort of space all the lighting to produce a kind of sphere. So it's kind of little slight distortions to it. We place a, a block at the center of the space, at the place that's the most hierarchical, let's say. The most, the tallest point of the space is where it's denied. Um, so it also forces you to produce diagonals, let's say, connecting back to the outside. So at one level, the, the outside <coughs> is very mute and blank. And the inside, and, and it seems almost cut off from the outside, uh, just sort of like a, the zinc uh, box, and and then on the inside, I think it's very open and connected to the exterior. I think we play with a lot of very basic um, tropes of architecture and modernism. So things like problems of frontality. I think most cases, none of our projects have fronts or sort of deny the front. Um, things like. Uh, trying to, to get rid of hierarchy. This is a project for a house in New Mexico. It's made out of SIFs. It's, you know, it's, there's a lot of, I could, talk, I could give a narrative about all these through a technological narrative, which is usually what I do, a kind of more matter of fact. They all are, um, they all, we, we are good architects in the sense that we care about how things work for our clients. Uh, but it's not really the point. But in some, certain cases, there are these sort of technological inventions in them. But at the same time, there are games of composition, etc. So in this case, I could I could argue for this through this. We invented this idea of the kind of uh, a heat sink architecture. So this has got a continuous aluminum wrapper around it. And so when the sun hits on one side, the heat is dissipated to the cool side here because it's all continuous stuff like that so you reduce your heat your heat gain etc sort of a project in uh, Denmark for an art school an architecture school kind of an amazing client and project um, I mean the plans are nothing in a way all the services all of the stuff is pulled up into the these areas above the porches. So the plans are pretty radically open. One of the inventions was, I mean, we, it's, these things are we're used to dealing with incredibly bad budgets, honestly, it's another thing. So like the, the, the detailing is like a mirrored stainless channel between this kind of very uh, gray cement panel, very cheap cement panel. It's hard to photograph, but it produces this kind of shimmering effect as you move around it. There's a kind of, the thinness of the buildings produces a kind of transparency, which is one thing we talked about. So you, there's a sort of visual collapse so you're in one studio looking at another studio, looking you know inside, outside, inside, outside. So when you're in the architecture school part of the studio, you're looking at, let's say, graphic design. You're, everyone is very aware of each other. We did things like, um, the client was pretty open, like, had, like asked them to place chairs in all these spaces outside so people could sit and hang out, um, sort of focus on these spaces in between where people mi meet and mix. Something like 65% uh, of all Danish architects are at, go through Kravis home, which is crazy to think about. <laughs> the damage we do. Um, an orphanage in Kathmandu. It's under construction, slow process. Uh, it's basically a concentric uh, kind of logic large fat core at the center for seismic and an exoskeleton on the exterior um, working also for seismic. We were concerned about this from day one in a way, sort of a squat. It's a squat kind of gumdrop shape. 
kind of cubic almost. Um, and then with the exterior space, we, we have all these X, X's of uh, circulation. So they, they work like kind of like a cross bracing. And then it produces a it produces a kind of picturesque space between the two structures, uh, kind of like a kind of circulation, kind of system of circulation that allows also access to the client. And this really comes from the client, not us. Who was really interested in let's say sustainability, vertical gardening, things you have to learn as an architect. Like like uh, we had to do all these studies on how to grow papaya in a vertical surface and things like this. So, I mean, it doesn't. So it won't look quite uh, as, I mean, I like it in this form, by the way, the more colder uh, thing, but it will be a different thing when it's done. It'll be more lush. A store in New York, it's actually in the bottom of a Neil Denari building. And it wants one on the High Line that is really curvy. Um, it was a kind of leftover space. Uh, he didn't, obviously, there was no concern with it. So part of the problem is just, it's a different scale, just how to, all of these are ducts and stuff in the ceiling, just capturing space in the ceiling. Like just pushing up, trying to capture as much space as we can, and then doing things like, this is before, there's a shelving system that went in after this photograph. Um, kind of just smaller, scale material things. Like things like this, I don't know if you can see it here, like we were really obsessed with um, marble on marble. So the drawing, AutoCAD patches of marble um, uh, milled into real marble. So th like games of, of a kind of modular shelving system that is like just a grid of holes and you can basically take it out, we design these brackets and you screw them in and you put shelving wherever you want. Yeah, you can see it there. A store in Miami. Uh, facade. These were, so I didn't show, like we did a whole, we've had a whole life in a way before the work I'm showing here of just, in a way the narrative I gave about technology and things like this is also maybe a self-reflection, kind of critical self-reflection. Um, and we were even, we were even, let's say, trying to get out of it while we were in it. We probably still are both in it and trying to get out of it. But like, um, so we would do things like, uh, we, we work with, uh, processing. We do, we write a lot of software also in the office. So, and we do things like, uh, the way that the software works is just literally dropping blocks, or in this case, shapes, just squares. Uh, with gravity into a kind of frame, spit like a kind of container, and just having them pile up. And that would be the way of producing it. So it's like using these oper like chance operations, sort of playing with, for us, the, the world, let's say, when we were taught physics, thinking about physics was kind of anti-conceptual. They were always separate. So you were either on the side of geometry or you were on the side of physics. And those two worlds were not supposed to meet. Um, you were for, like, the geometry project was the conceptual project of architecture, let's say, um, a formalism. And physics was a kind of about real, the real project, craft, um, material, etc. So. We were trying to always find ways to smush, smush those kind of, that relate those kind of dialectics. Let's say, so things like we're using video game physics simulators to produce a, a world that is already is it real or is it fake? Is it conceptual? Is it uh, material? What? Who knows? Just to so you you know the thing which is also nice is it takes maybe like about a month to write the software and then it takes like five seconds to produce stuff. So you just literally are just dropping blocks. And these are obviously, there's games in here that are, we're doing it, or I would say, they're casual at one level, but they're also, you know, we're aware of Venturi and uh, Khan and things like this. So you, you, you know, it's hard not to think of something like Wu Hall, 
a little bit, or some of the some of the con pieces of the late con where he's dealing with kind of these sorts of things. So this is a store in Miami. It's under construction right now. Um, it's a strange project that you get asked to do. I mean, this is so old. Presenting it now is, is crazy. It's, this was designed maybe, I want to say six years ago. Something like this, five years ago. So um, uh, it's all marble holes that are about three feet deep. You know, you do this thing, it takes five seconds to sort of casual dropping the rocks, then you have to go and work with engineers. I mean, it's not, in the end, I like the software better. Like, I wish, I still want to figure out how to build something like this. But like uh, this, you know, it's something else, but it's still exciting. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about foreclosed, but yeah, stuff I won't talk about. Anyways, I'll just, I'll just zoom through this stuff. Um, or just <laughs> scroll through it quickly. This is a, these two houses are actually houses that will get built this summer, hopefully. This is a house that's built. This is almost done. The project in Brooklyn. Um, kind of a, it was a new building, but we, it was an existing building on the site, which we just basically just tore down except for the existing facade. Um, we kept it just out of, because we have a, we usually have problems designing, let's say, facades. Um, so we kept it, and then we just we filled in the existing openings with a with a custom brick, actually, and made new openings. The floor heights changed; everything changed, so produced a kind of things are slightly everything's off. The, the back of it is all is all mirrored stainless. Um, I don't know how the neighbors are going to react still, but we'll see. Um, it has a series of chimneys which bring light into the space, but also are one, three of them are mirrored to bring like work as peris like kind of periscopes or ways to bring light down into this large dark space here, and also are for venting because this is a painting studio for venting all the, the oil paint fumes up. We've done things on our projects recently where we do a lot of, um, we actually work more and more as fabrication, doing fabrication or things like, um, like the stairs are all the structural steel. We did all the work ourselves. We had it, we were basically the fabricators on it and just have it, uh, we work in solid works and we, we work with about three different shops. Somebody does cutting, someone does bending, someone that does powder coating, et cetera, um, have it shipped to the site and have it bolted together. Everything is bolted. We don't use welds in general with any of our work. We try to do everything bolted so it can be disassembled easily. These are the plans. It's a pretty straightforward project. There's these, I like these two large X braces in this lower. There's these two X's that are exposed. This is a glass wall uh, in front of the X. Things like brick on brick patterns. For, these are some of the things we made for the custom bricks. We work with, um, we may suffer kind of the hipster bespoke architecture thing we were talking about a little bit. But um, we make uh, stuff. We just make junk. So um, for projects, we're making furniture for this guy. We were, do, we were doing things like, it's, this is from a, maybe a, over a couple months ago. Um, so we're making stuff. So this is all going to be opened up to a large space. Basically, it's already done. The client, you know, doesn't need. It's got a lot of light, natural light that comes in. Some of the tiles that we've done. This is old. Project. This is the picture on the poster. Again. Project in Chicago. Corridor house. It's based on a kind of idea that of taking the just circulation of a building and turning it into rooms or something, or turning not rooms but occupying it. So taking this kind of thing that is normally a network 
that connects rooms and to use it as a kind of space of occupation itself. So we, for this project also we did things like made rock, bean bags, using texture, rendered texture maps we found online to make furniture. And then the other thing we did a few years ago, we opened up, um, I'll end on this I guess, is like, um, we started an online store as part of, we did this as a, like, like so these parallel projects that are outside of practice, let's say one is the uh, software, another are videos, um, and then we started doing these um, objects and part of it is, um, yeah, I can just open it up I guess if I'm on the internet. So we did a series called Reproductions. This is this kind of a bizarre thing we did. The first one we did was a scented candle. Um, so we tried to make these stories, we make these objects and then we write these stories about the objects. So this one is about Ada, Ada Um and they're, they're problems of authorship for us. Even the idea of, like, they're fake reproductions, so part of it is that some people thought they were real reproductions for a while and we got a little bit in trouble. Uh, they thought we were stealing intellectual property from Adafalos or something. Um, and so the story goes at like Los, uh, when we, again, these are dialectics that I think we were taught. Like you, like when you were an architecture student, you could either be on like Adafalos side of the equation or a kind of Hoffman, like it was one or the other. You were either, again, a conceptual architect or a kind of corporate commercial whore. And, uh, and Hoffman was the kind of commercial guy and Los was the real conceptual guy and of course we all wanted to be Los and and I think the reality is more confusing nowadays so um, you know so we did a story made up a story about like so thinking about Los as a kind of student where he was taking like a summer camp with Hoffman and Hoffman asked him to design a scented candle. We were also trying to think of things that were not, like the worst things you could think of. So we wanted to start with something that everyone would be sort of disgusted by. And it seemed like the scented candle was the way to go. And, um, and there are also stories of erasure. So all of the stories are like, you know, the, there's no original documentation left. Uh, everything got somewhat deleted by mistake. Whatever, whatever it would be. Like they all end in the same kind of conundrum. Uh, anyway, that's what we're up to. I don't know. Does that does that kind of help? Yeah. Okay, Does so have questions or? Well, uh, there's very little time left for questions. I'm afraid. Sorry. But, yeah. No, no. I mean, I'm very happy you opened your own vault with projects because I think it it explains so much. Huh? I'm happy. I'm there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I have a. Uh, I had a question about because I, I was uh, not remembering this, that this uh, quote by Colin Rove, uh, I mean, quoting uh, Van Eyck at the very beginning. And then when you went finally to, the, to your own project, I realized that even Van Eyck is a first Eyck, double. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's, I mean, it's quite a surprise because uh, you never think that Van Eyck is now, let's say, on the list, no? Of yeah. what, uh, yeah, our generation will do. Like, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I'm just curious about this. Uh, well, definitely the repetition, let's say, um, the systematic repetition of things like the orphanage or even... I mean, I, I think Van Eyck is, is interesting. I, I just was struck, I had the same, I wouldn't, I normally don't think about Van Eyck, by the way. I'm thinking about other people. But I think Van Eyck, um, when I, I was struck by that, because I also was rereading, I thought I was going to be asked questions about Venturi, mm -hmm. complexity and contract. So I reread this also on the airplane over. 
<laughs> and um, <laughs> you're too well prepared. <laughs> and uh, so I was thinking about you know th these things, and I was struck by Van Eyck also there, and I thought like this is just strange how Van Eyck is like a little secret presence in 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 this work, and um, yeah, I don't know what to make of it. It's just there, it sort of popped up. I, I wouldn't say. I, th I think consciously we're probably thinking more about. Um, when I presented this, I presented the indifference thing about our work, and and uh, I, and afterwards everyone was came up uh, and said, like one of my, I was a student of uh, Yves Lambois, who was one of my teachers, and he came to the lecture, which was really nice, and he came up afterwards and he said, I think indifference is the wrong word. Uh, you should you should be. He then went into like he's you know he's French, so he went into Bart and said you should be thinking about uh, whatever, Blanche, uh, Scree Blanche, or something like this, or the writing blank writing or something. Mm -hmm. And um, he thought that was more what the work is about, the kind of degree zero condition, maybe. The, I thought it was interesting. I don't know if it's accurate, but I just, I thought that was a kind of interesting. I don't know if we're quite there. I'm more interested in the space between, let's say, pop and minimalism. That's why indifference was interesting to me as a kind of bridge. But, but funny enough, I mean, because of course I very much appreciated your uh, very complex construction of the narrative as you presented here, where it becomes increasingly difficult to understand whether you embrace or you kind of push away, for yeah. example, the New York Five. At the same time, whether that's your own judgment or not, uh, now let's say with, with your whole presentation around full circle. I can only say, I mean, how close can you get to New York Five? I mean, it's almost literally so. I mean, okay, yeah. o on a very literal level, I mean, whether it's the chimneys and, uh, and yeah, the yeah. archetypes of all different kinds. Also, the I mean, houses. if you look back at the, uh, the house houses yeah. and so forth, uh, also if you look at, say, at the, at the Chicago project where there is something like a chimney or a column or whatever it is, yeah. but at the same time it seems to be hollow or it's not really yeah. useful or, yeah, yeah. I mean, so it even kind of push it and sort of press it. So, uh, in, in a way, maybe Eisenman was trying to do it, and then again, yeah. totally not. I mean, but not with the sérieux of, of Eisenman. I mean, I found it funny on how you were so much focusing on how they present themselves, and how obviously, uh, if you if you are ready to embrace that heritage, yeah. you do it without the people. In fact, right? <laughs> yeah. you, you would like yeah. to, uh, uh, I would say, reappropriate New York Five without any of the five architects, yeah, yeah, and that's how they, they talked about. It. Perhaps only Hayduk being the, 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 the exception because he was indifferent enough in how he presented himself. Yeah, I love his presentation. Yeah, and, and that, that I found interesting. Yeah, that's that's like and then, place. if you talk about indifference, well, perhaps uh, that book represents a possible track of that in architecture, no? I mean... Yeah, I think also, for me, let's say John's is also the guy who bridges, yeah. let's say, minimalism pop. The, um, John's is an interesting model. I can't say, I, the thing with John's for me is like somebody, I've never really liked his paintings. No, me neither. They're very ugly, actually. Yeah, I don't like them, but yeah. I think they're, they're interesting. Yeah. Like, I... I... Like, with, I like, like, Ellsworth Kelly. You know what I mean? Like, stuff like this. Yeah, everybody does. But, like, I like... You know what I mean? They're it's like like Venturi now. Yeah, it's yeah. like like yeah. Venturi, for yeah. sure. I think, for me, like... Um, John's, though, as a model, seems <coughs> like an interesting model to think about. Uh, now I do think like, we're also at a moment where yeah, I don't know what is happening at the school, but like students, a couple things seem more and more important. Like performance, for sure. Like actually, the performance of an architect seems more and more important nowadays. So that's one thing. The other thing is like let's say technological narratives. Everyone is doing using technology to produce things that seem anti-technological. This seems to be a trope I noticed. So you'll use robots to make just piles of crap or something. Like you don't need a robot to do that, obviously. But it so part of it is part of it is the this um, the indifference model for me is a, a model in the face of both so par the parametrics project and even the technological project of architecture did a couple things. One is the technology technological side really put a lot of effort or into, let's say, really uh, ideas of novelty and newness again. And for me, parametrics did something where it collapsed historical models of both 
positivism, which I'm interested in, that side of it, but also with expressionism. So you get things like, I've never understood Zaha and Shuma, I guess Patrick now, um, say gestures, like a t whatever, painter, like literally painterly gestures of architecture that are then argued through mathematics. Like to me, those are two models that are at odds with each other. And one of the great, it could be an incredible invention or like kind of the end of the world. I just don't know. Like as a kind of thing, it could be liberating to suggest that those two models can coexist uh, to produce something. And they do. I just, for me, they seem like uh, a problem. I, I'm, I'm definitely in the, the kind of history, the avant-garde that is anti-expressionism. I mean, I think this is in our work. Um, I just don't, I don't, I can't understand why even so much. It's maybe something that I inherited, but it's there. So I, and whether or not it's good or bad, I, I don't even know. I just sort of am working through it still. So. And then why does everybody like Venturi now? Why does everyone like Venturi at this moment? Um, I think Venturi... I don't know. Why is, I mean, for me, I think he's the indifference also. I mean, he's the closest we get, if I want to put it on my own terms, like he's the closest to Jasper Johns, mm -hmm. probably, in the model. Like even that we were talking about like that ground, the coffee shop, mm -hmm. the early stuff. I mean, it's literally the same stencil type as John's paintings. Uh, he is a guy who I think is thinking like John's, even as this idea of, a, let's say, the, the framework of the painting collecting all this other stuff into some other relationship. Like he's doing this in the architecture. So I think if you look at the dates on things, and even like the, one of the few paintings he shows in, in complexity is, a John, is the flag. Uh, it's, he uses like, he has, like basically it's, I, I can only think of three three artists that he has in there, like John's, I'm talking about Lewis, uh, drip paintings, um, and Kelly. Yeah. And I think that's that's it, but I think John's is really the one. He sort of buries John's amongst uh, a bunch of other architects, in a way. It's like, it sticks out, because it's like, a, it's like cl basically classical architecture, and then all of a sudden there's John's sitting in there. So, um, So I think there's something there. I think also we're in, everyone is interested in, I, th I do think the media, we can't, I can't explain it, but I do think we're in a strange media environment where, where I think for, for Venturi, he's coming at a moment after heroic, like he's coming after kind of highly heroic mo moment of modernism for Venturi. So everything had been done, you know, all the, all the incredible uh, expressionism, let's say, of of uh, Rudolph, uh, of brutalism, even for, at that time, sort of this kind of extreme gestures, almost. Whether or not, you could also argue from in other ways. I do think that like, composition is essentially a historical cultural narrative that is up for debate all the time. And, um, and so after this moment of where every, this kind of heroic moment, um, and after Khan, I mean, Khan is the most, at one level, if you listen to Khan, like I enjoy Khan without listening to Khan, you know? Like Khan is, uh, if you listen to him, all the work is too pious. But if you just look, for me, when I look at the work, it's kind of silly. I mean, I like the work because it sort of has a crudeness to it almost. But, um, uh, and he plays games, like, you know, Khan, Khan plays the great games of like, no fronts also, like old school games. But, um, um, but, you know, you go to, you come after that, what does Venturi have to do? I mean, Venturi has to think, rethink the whole thing and find some space. So it's like the, you know, it's like the pathetic over the heroic, the, the ugly over the beautiful, whatever. You, he he's always sets up these kinds of conditions to argue for something something else uh, and it's it's usually a kind of indifference to complexity in a way and contradiction is a kind of indifference model it's an acceptance i think the problem with venturi was the same problem with, that the indifference people had eventually like so like um the criticism of someone like john cage is if you is that he accepted everything so he was able to he just accepted the world he didn't try to change it so the criticism is like he accepted fascism he was okay with it, so he was a big you know, supporter of, of Mao. 
or something. And um, uh, the, the problem with Venturi is that he gets kind of co-opted into uh, Reaganism economics at some point. His sort of acceptance of of a kind of right-wing politics. And so I think that's something to be aware of, but I don't know what you do about it exactly as an architect. I mean, I still think the model is, is a kind of liberatory model for right now, but I think it could become a problem. Very soon, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, sir.